Okay, dear all, it's time to, to begin. Okay. And and let, let, let me open with uh, some special words of this day of the conference. So, uh, you know, we dedicated this whole conference to our friend and colleague, uh, Konstantin Ivanov, uh, but today is kind of special day and uh, we tried to collect the talks of uh, those scientists who were closest with him, closest with uh, his uh, research interests. And uh, yeah, to, to make this special day dedicated to Kostya. Uh, many of you knew Konstantin personally, but just in case uh, I would like to briefly introduce him with this slide. So he, he was a person of uh, exceptional uh, depth and clarity of mind and uh, exceptional productivity and capacity. And honestly, I do not know, I did not meet any other person like him. So he was, he was really exceptional and he was already a star, but he was still a rising star. And uh, it's uh, so sad that uh, he uh, passed away this year. Um, he was a doctor of science, this is habilitation analog in Russia, and professor of Russian Academy of Science, and he was also a director of our Institute International Tomography Center for last three years, and he was a very good director, and we uh, loved him much. Uh, so his research interests uh, were quite broad. Um, he was generally interested in spin chemistry and physics in NMR, hyperpolarization, different kinds of polarizations like DNP, CIDNP. He was a theoretician, but with a, a great heart for experiment. And uh, recently he was very much interested and involved in spintronics and quantum computing. And he participated in uh, several uh, last uh, Japanese, Russian, Russian, Japanese uh, workshops on open shell compounds and molecular spin uh, devices. And uh, probably many of you who visited Avadji meetings uh, know him very well. Uh, yeah, and even he decided to take a, a leading role in the organization of uh, next future workshops. Uh, so he was uh, very much involved in, in society in this field. Yeah, he published more than 150 papers and he received many prizes, grants, awards. Uh, I would like to mention especially a Günther Laukin Prize last year, which is a kind of an MR Nobel Prize. And uh, it's extremely prestigious award in, in this field. Yeah, he was also a JSPS professor in 2016, and he visited Professor Takuyu and Sato in Osaka City University. Yeah. Uh, he was also a key organizer of uh, numerous conferences, schools, and networks, including quite, uh, let's say, influential networks like COST, uh, ICON, and so on. And uh, during this pandemic, uh, recent times, he organized a very good weekly internet seminar on NMR, uh, which connected hundreds of scientists uh, over the world and which was later renamed uh, in his honor. It's now called Konstantin Ivanov Intercontinental Seminar. He was also an editorial board member for several uh, very good magnetic resonance journals. And uh, yeah, he sadly passed away on 5th of March this year it's everything has happened very unexpectedly and uh, extremely fast. It took uh, probably about two weeks uh, since he felt sick with COVID. And uh, then, yeah, he, he received all treatment that was possible. And uh, you, you, you all know this is a very strange disease. Uh, sometimes, uh, it attacks uh, totally healthy people very severely and uh, perhaps scientists will study it for many years to more to understand why all this happening so yeah in Konstantin case it was very hard 
and the doctor said in the hospital that this was one of the uh, heaviest cases since the beginning of pandemic. So he sadly passed away on 5th of March this year. And, uh, you know, we, we of course, all uh, lost our friend and colleague, and we will miss him very much. Uh, but still, I believe he will live in our hearts and minds for many years to come. And uh, today, I would like to invite you, those of you who will uh, give lectures, if you wish, you can uh, share some past interactions with Constantine. Uh, you can share some reflections. Uh, maybe you do it natural in natural ways. It's, it's totally up to you. And uh, so let's begin this special day, uh, the scientific part of it. And I would like to pass microphone to the chairman of the first session, uh, Kiminori Maeda from Saitama University, Japan. He was a close friend of Constantine, and he visited Novosibirsk actually many times. Well, at least several times. And he was also, he, he is also a friend of mine. So Kiminori, please, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. It's Kiminori Maeda from Saitama University. I'm quite honored to have uh, some, uh, some chair of the, uh, this first session. Okay, first speaker is uh, Takeji Takui uh, from, Osa from Osaka City University. Uh, maybe no need to, to read the title, please. Takeji. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Kiminori, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And first of all, I also thank the Matsway and Sergei and Ryotarev and Viktor Ovcherenko and the all the other uh, member of organizing committees to organize such a, I mean, a well-prepared uh, online conferences under such a difficult condition which we have been facing. Uh, to begin with uh, my talk, I would like, also I would like to spend my time a few minutes in referring to the, the uh, splendor of the time with posture. Uh, if we pass away uh, so young and this year, and uh, here is the special, I don't know, so Sergey. Will you help me? Please share the screen. Yeah. Oh, okay, start working. Um, here the, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, it's start we, working. We, 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 I hear the we, special, I mean, obituary given by uh, Alex, uh, Alexandro and a professor, a French professor, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, now uh, screen share is not working now. Can you try to? Share the yeah. screen. It's working on my side. No, we do not see your screen. Oh, so what can I do? Yes, we see it. You see it in the screen mode. Uh -huh. Screen mode. Right. Not yet. Not yet. So we see it um, in PowerPoint layout. Yeah, yeah. You just activate full screen. Yeah. Is that working? 
Oh, ah, yes. yes. Perfect. Okay. So I changed the, another mood. Okay, so uh, let me start again. He had a very special, I mean, the obituary given by uh, Alexandra and the uh, French, I mean, Professor Bo uh, Bodenhausen. And uh, you can see the how, I mean, the coaster achieved uh, unbelievable, I mean, the achievement uh, whilst uh, he was young. Um, you can see the this uh, obituary in the website and here the uh, cited uh, from uh, I mean, magnetic resonance, I mean, the journals. And also I would like to uh, join all of you in extending our uh, sincere condolences to his wife, Elena. Sometimes uh, I met Kostya, he talked about uh, the Elena's and his uh, beloved, I mean, the daughters. So we spent a very nice time uh, with the poster in Nara and uh, several times, and he bought a very uh, splendid, I mean, the souvenir for his daughters. I still remember this is a un really unforgettable, I mean, thing. And I, I also uh, would like to, I mean, the join the order, I mean, the member of the ITC in extending uh, our condolences. Okay, here that you can see the coaster, the center of our, oh, this is uh, not all. Uh, this was taken in 2015 in Awaji Island. You can see many Russian I mean, the friends uh, and the Japanese friend as well and the, the people from all over the world. And uh, this talk is uh, truly dedicated to the Konstantin, I mean, Ivanov. Uh, he's a really I mean, present Russian young friend, and uh, I should say, very splendid, his mentor. Um, the title of my talk is uh, written here, and uh, uh, probably, as already you know, uh, there is a poster presentation by one of our group member, Takeshi Yamane, two days ago. So here the title is his, I mean, the, his presentation. And my talk is a little bit relevant to his, his work also. Uh, probably you remember, some of you remember the, uh, two years ago, I mean, three years ago, Astra Hans, I presented the uh, some part of uh, this talk, I mean, this work. And uh, at that time, so we didn't include the, any uh, effect from uh, hyperfine tensors to, uh, I mean, the uh, relationship between the uh, fictitious one spin, one half, and two spin, two spin Hamiltonian. And in his Yamaneskun's talk, I mean presentation, he included the hyperfine tensor effect. And I think that this was the first time uh, to include the uh, such effect for, uh, to derive the uh, relationship, exact relationship between the um, fictitious spin one half approach and the full spin Hamiltonian approach. And uh, probably, I mean, the, um, during uh, the Yamanekun's presentation, uh, Matsui uh, raised the uh, very critical question. So why such a bridging gap approach is necessary? Despite the, for example, I mean, the easy spin is available. The easy spin is a really brute force approach and a very powerful, uh, probably everybody knows, but nevertheless, so uh, the Americans, I mean, the work, so why so he did such work? So here are the three reasons. Here are the reason one, uh, so recently the high spin, I mean, the molecule is, is going to uh, attracting, I mean, the, much attention uh, to apply such molecule to quantum computing or 
other molecular devices. So in this, for this purposes, uh, you need a really uh, accurate ZF, ZFS tensor values. They are all, I mean, in surrounded by a very low uh, surrounding symmetries. And here the reason too, so probably everybody knows already, high spin, high frequency EPR spectroscopy is, is available, but uh, uh, not for ordinary laboratories. The most of the laboratory has expand, conventional expand equipment. So, so uh, if you have a very high spin with a sizable ZFS tensors, so you do some experiment in at the X band spectroscopy, you have a problem. So this is another reason why. So we need to uh, derive uh, the bridging gap, bridging the gaps between the uh, fictitious spin one and a half and the true spin Hamiltonian approaches. And here the another reason three. Uh, recently, uh, uh, so very reliable quantum chemical calculation uh, is available to interpret the uh, magnetic tensors now. There's uh, one of our group of Sugisaki and is involved uh, very much in this, I mean, development. So, so we need a uh, very accurate, I mean, experimental data for magnetic tensors. Anyway, if you do the uh, reliable quantum chemical calculation. This is the third reason why. So we need to uh, derive the bridging gaps uh, between the two approaches. And as I already said, uh, three reasons. But uh, here the uh, crucial I mean, issues. This has been uh, long-standing issues. Um, in our uh, modern resonance communities, uh, there's the putative ideas. The high spin Hamiltonian for an S value is uh, three over two in the presence of such a magnetic field cannot be solved exactly or analytically. And this means the presence of uh, the static magnetic field is really problematic if the magnetic field is not sizable. Okay. Um, and the second, the exact and analytic expression for the eigenvalue or eigenfunction for three S value three are more than three over two in the presence of a static magnetic field never been documented. Okay, so we did uh, this work already and it's published in three or four years ago already. And uh, but there is another reason, general reason. Uh, exact and analytical solution can contribute to the, uh, I mean, the, to the derivation of the relationship between the gap between the uh, fictitious spin one half and the true spin Hamiltonian in a straightforward manner. And the uh, analytical solution is very, very general but a brute force approach gives us a rather particular solutions. This is another reason why, general reason why, so we need uh, such a derivation. So here, the, it's already written here, and we need a uh, bit uh, theoretical, I mean, the considerations, okay? So some people said uh, these approach may be very, uh, pedantic, not useful, not significant in the ordinary, I mean, the scientific practices. But I don't think so, because there's a lots of, I mean, the exact analytical solution in the field of, I mean, the magnetic uh, magnetism or magnetic resonances. Okay, I can show you some of those in my presentation. Okay. Here, the, uh, you see, you don't have to read everything, but uh, you see uh, easy spin based simulation. Can you try the true spin Hamiltonian? I, and um, 
the might let you read the reasonable the accurate experimental data within a particular high spins, okay? And, uh, but uh, probably you know, the simulation processes for the goal is try and, uh, and error based. So this means that uh, we need a bit more general, I mean, approach to help to this I mean, simulation processes. This is another reason why so um, bridging the gap, uh, I mean, the relationship of the bridging gap between the two approaches the necessary, okay? So because of the time, so I better skip this side. Uh, this is a bit of general, I mean, the ideas. Um, Okay, here the, uh, another example, um, exact how exact analytical approach is important. You can see the uh, a very new approach for magnetic parameter gradient method to interpret the line broadening uh, appearing in the fine structure EPR spectroscopy for high spins. Okay. Um, yeah, the historical, I mean, the descriptions. Um, probably some of you knows the uh, very randomly oriented spectra from our first spin quintet uh, metacarbene systems or metadinitrine systems. Uh, this was, I mean, observed by Wasserman and co workers in the States. And if you look at their spectra, as a matter of fact, their spectra never, I mean, the published at all in the paper. But we know the uh, some uh, peculiar, I mean, the features uh, of the fine structure spectra taken from them. Um, you can see the very broad, uh, peculiar line broadening appearing at many canonical peaks that never fully analyzed. So that means uh, they never, I mean, derived the accurate ZFS parameters. Oh, this has been the long-standing problem. So we tackle this problem. Here, the top of the spectra is observed, and the second one, and, and the, the last one, the third one is the simulated. You can see the uh, peculiar differences particularly in terms of the uh, line broadening. For example, X and Y and Z means uh, denoting uh, canonical peaks. A denotes the uh, off-axis, principal axis lines. Um, canonical peak shows the peculiar broadening, but this is not for hyperfine broadening uh, or other, I mean, the uh, effect. This is truly due to uh, uh, ZFS, uh, size of the D ZFS tensors. So this has been solved by uh, uh, exact, using the uh, exact solution of iron field method, which was developed by uh, Kazanov Sato in our group. For, uh, you can see the exact solution I can feel a solution for a very high spin in his uh, doctoral thesis. Okay, this was published and uh, solved the, all the such long-standing issues and derived the very accurate uh, ZFS parameters from quintet, the first high spin quintet molecules. Yeah, the another one. Um, time is running out, but uh, uh, you know the. Uh, a very famous book written by uh, uh, Alexandro Bensini and Dante Gadeschi, EBR of Extended Couple System. This was published in 1985, but now it's available in the Dover version. And if you look at the, the chapter four, the spectra of clusters, this is a very nice example. They derived the very exact analytical solution uh, to bridge the uh, 
agree between the uh, individual spins or spin Hamiltonian and the cluster spin Hamiltonian. Uh, you can see the equation, very simple equation in the middle of the, my slide. Um, the HA or HB include the full spin Hamiltonian for individual spins. And they derived the relationship between the uh, parameters, magnetic parameter, I mean the tensors between individual spins and cluster spins. And you can see the all the I mean, necessary coefficient for analyzing the clusters, I mean the exchange coupled cluster systems. This is another very good example. And, uh, but the problem with this approach is uh, there's no exact analytical solution with the individual high spin Hamiltonian. So, but uh, you know the exact relationship between the cluster spin Hamiltonian and the individual spin Hamiltonian. But you don't know the uh, exact solution uh, with the individual high spin Hamiltonian. The Yamanekin uh, solved this problem, uh, but not free, but only a uh, quantum number S varies up to seven over two. I think uh, seven over two is enough, enough for the time being. Okay. Now, so you know the uh, 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 this issue, very important issue in the field of traditional magnetism. So you can see uh, uh, very approximate uh, approaches to derive the, the for example, um, magnetism in one dimension or two dimension. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, the exact analytical solution for magnetism, of course, this is relevant to the thermodynamic behaviors in infinite 1D or 2D spin arrays have been derived. And of course, under some assumptions. But unfortunately, in most cases, the exact solution available is only for absence of static magnetic field. But nevertheless, derived the exact solution have uh, contributed to enormous three in the field, the field of the magnetism. You can see the exact analytical solution derived so far for uh, Hamiltonian exchange spin Hamiltonian uh, indicated in the title of the, or subtitle in the slide. You see in the black, I mean the red, I mean the in red, uh, static magnetic field is uh, is present, but all of, all the cases is for only for static magnetic field is zero. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, the exact, I mean, the analytical solution uh, gave uh, lots of ideas or physical insight in the magnetic. Okay, here's another example. Probably, you know, the uh, purely organic high spin system. This was, I mean, the uh, published quite a long, long time ago, even before uh, you, you come out, you came out in the world. Uh, the, on the left hand side, there is a uh, very typical topological polymer of high spin with high spin. This, I mean, the energy, I mean, the solution is derived analytically, and this is very exact. And this gave uh, lots of, I mean, the ideas how. Uh, to, I mean, the, uh, design the organic uh, high spin systems or even uh, uh, super uh, paramagnetic systems or even a ferromagnetic systems. And the right hand side, this is a two dimensional system. Also, this was, I mean, so exact and analytically. And here's another uh, example. 
Uh, this is uh, 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 a poor, I mean, the Hewlett-Packard uh, systems. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, the argument, I mean, the uh, contradictory argument. The really, I mean, C62 minus in the ground state is a triplet or C60 trianionic system is in the ground state of the quartet state. But I believe uh, an ear that means C60 uh, dianion or trianion are in the high spin in the ground state. And this also gives a, a bionic issues uh, this is relevant to the post EPR spectroscopy. You see the left hand side, you see the uh, inversion recovery, I mean, curves. Uh, you see the subtle weak ring, I mean, the nature. Uh, this is from, uh, this is, uh, I mean, the uh, randomly oriented spectrum. Uh, this weak ring is due to the quantum resonance tunneling between the, I mean, the distorted, I mean, the, uh, systems. But we saw uh, this weak ring and, and the trianionic system also gives uh, similar weak ring natures. And we I mean, analyzed this uh, weak ring to derive the um, phonon bottleneck, if, uh, I mean, the phenomenon. And in order to do this, so we need a very exact, I mean, the solution for vibronic program. So we did this using the analytical exact solution for a symmetric double wave potential that it's given in the left hand side. And you use, you have to use the uh, coherent hypergeometric function. This is a very complicated one, but this is the exact solution. And this, I mean, you invoking this equation, we derived the uh, nuclear displacement for C60 to uh, minus, uh, such as A value. A value means displacement, nuclear displacement at 0 0.3 or 0 0.43 or something like this. And the tunneling frequency, 30 kilohertz because of the phonon bottleneck effect, okay? And if you go to the asymmetric potential, there's no, I mean, the exact analytical solutions. But, uh, uh, but here, the another example, if you go to the much more simple, I mean, theoretical considerations, you can solve the uh, exactly the, I mean, the uh, all the energy of this, this double potential. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, exact solution. And this gives you a uh, nuclear displacement is something like 0 0.36, uh, very similar to the uh, value derived from uh, quantum mechanical, I mean, treatment here. All these data is all done by using the exact analytical solution. And the time is running out. So I'll skip this, I mean, the nutation phenomena. And uh, okay, so in order to, uh, I mean, the interpret the hyperfine effect appearing in the nutation uh, behavior in the high spin systems, uh, you need uh, a very exact analytical uh, values from a reduced rotation matrix element for very high nuclear spin systems. But this has been derived, okay? Uh, and uh, okay, here the future work. Uh, there's no, I mean, exact analytical solution for mutation phenomena for arbitrary high spins, but uh, except for symmetric ZFS tensors. If you have uh, asymmetric ZFS tensors, there's no exact such solutions. This is going to be the future work. And uh, why so we need a such an exact uh, analytical solution? Uh, this is because uh, um, if you go to the, uh, if you use the 
high spin systems like uh, QDIT. QDIT means uh, uh, not qubit, qubit means the uh, high uh, dimensional bit qubit systems. Okay, so in order to use uh, this qubit for quantum control or in the quantum computers, so you need, of course, in the presence of the static magnetic field, you need uh, exact solutions. Um, so already, I mean, that we published the recently published paper. In uh, applied magnetic resonance, uh, the written in the, the at the bottom of my slide. Um, in this case, so we only use the uh, spin one half. But if you go to the high spin system, I think you need a more sophisticated theoretical considerations. Okay, and here the big problem. The Victor Bonnell approach for motion of time dependent magnetization. Uh, I mean, exact solution uh, for this model never soap. Okay. For example, everybody knows Brock equation. The Brock equation has never been solved generally, analytically, fully analytically. But uh, I think uh, if you uh, solve this problem, we have uh, enormous, I mean, the contribution to the relaxation program. Okay, I better stop the, uh, my talk with the acknowledgement. This work is partially supported by JSPS and uh, RFBR and the Japan Russian Research Cooperative Program. This uh, uh, happened between 2017 and 2018. Uh, one of the leader on the Russian side is Elena Babriansky. So also this has this work has been supported by uh, Mixed and JST and AOAR and D. And thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you very much. Uh, please try to react <laughs> uh, on the, some reaction button or something like that. I have, uh, I can accept only one brief question. Okay, Matvi? Uh, Matvi, please. Oh, actually, I just applauded. <laughs> ah, applaud. Okay. Ah, you, you raise a hand. Okay, any question or? May I ask a question? Okay, Sergey, please. So which part? Uh, uh, a part about the C60. You show us different. Uh -huh, okay. You show us different uh, models uh, for the energy surface, uh, okay. and what is so? And you use them for uh, uh, for solution of these equations. But was what is the we actual? We included the, uh, nuclear. I mean the wave wave function to solve the vibrony problem. We derived the exact solution for nuclear, I mean, the, to solve the nuclear uh, wave functions. Okay, and, I mean, and, and this, uh, excuse me, and this double potential well, is it uh, approximation or it's what is the, the actual This is surface? actually the approximation because uh, true, I mean, the picture is like this. A symmetric M potential may be necessary. But uh, we don't know how to solve exactly analytically uh, this nuclear, I mean, the wave functions. We checked the lots of a document, but uh, we couldn't solve. But uh, we can solve this. And we can solve this. And also, we can solve asymmetric, I mean, the potential for this simple double square well. You can solve this. I didn't show the detail, but nevertheless, it is possible. Thank you. There are lots of such, I mean, the, a chance to solve the very complicated <laughs> problem by using the analytical exact solutions. Probably, I you know, Maida san knows uh, uh, there are many, many examples in the spectroscopy of uh, small molecules to solve the vibronic problem. 
They use mm. the, the, uh, the really exact analytical solutions, but not for uh, sizable molecules, of course. Yeah. I think the analytical That's... exact solution is really general, never particular. So I think that's a point uh, to derive such uh, exact relationship between the, for example, I mean, the spin one half approach and true spin Hamiltonian mm. approach. Mm. But of course, the relationship is not almighty, of course, mm. but nevertheless, the people maybe prefer to going, uh, I mean, the brute force approach or numerical, I mean, the diagonalization approach, but uh, you, you lose the, some sort of a physical insight. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you, we, you, we use, we better use both ways, of course. But sometimes I think an analytical solution help a lot to understand the, what's going on or uh, something predictable. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Professor Takui. And, and now move to the second speakers, uh, Alexandra Yorkovskaya uh, from Novosibirsk. Okay, please. I could not switch on demonstration. Ah, yes, I yeah. can. Can. So thank you for kind organizing committee for kind uh, opportunity to give a memorial lecture about Konstantin Ivanov in this uh, joint uh, Russian Japanese seminar. So as you heard already on the 5th of March, our friend and director of International Community Center passed away. And in the obituary, which we wrote together with Hans Martin Fitt and Gerd Minkowski, the we wrote that the candle that burns twice as bright, burns half as long. So that's directly related to the short but very bright life of Konstantin uh, Ivanov. We shall deeply miss Kostya as exceptional human being. He was a creative and rigorous scientist and generous and attentive friend and considerate and immediately civilized colleague. He was not only a great scientist, but also a good human being, always sincere, honest, and considerate. In addition, he was a great citizen of the scientific community Aside from his demanding job as a director of International Tomography Center in Novosibirsk, he kept his research at the high level and organized a multitude of meetings, seminars, and webinars. Talking about his biography, I choose his favorite uh, template with all these funny spins, and I will show his very short biography on the his favorite template. So he was born in Akadem Garadok in 1977, and he studied physics at the Novosibirsk State University, specialized in chemical physics, as many of us did. So this is how Novosibirsk State University was building more like in those days and still the same. This is why one of the earliest photo of Kostya whom I met when he first came to ITC. And he came ITC right after obtaining his bachelor degree in Institute of Chemical Kinetics and the supervision of Dr. Glebov and Plusnin. And he did the, the only time that he did experimental work, he studied water reaction and solution. And after that, he moved to theoretical chemistry group and the leadership of Professor Oxen. And he became a scientific mentor for the next few years. This is Professor Nikita Oxen, and this is three of us in the Mexican restaurant. We used to go quite often all over the time. And 
this photo in front of a tabography center, Kostya, me, and Nikita. And this is one of the conferences that they attend together. Only two years later, Kostya successfully defended PhD thesis. And the title of his thesis was Kinetic of Diffusion Controlled Reaction of Radical Recombination and Energy and Electron Transfer Process. He was supervised by Renat Sakdiev and Nikita Mugzit. And uh, that happened because in those times, Nikita was not yet professor. So two of them brought uh, his doctor work and he graduated with the highest degree, summa cum laude. At the same year, he married with Elena Kagapolceva. And then year 2010, his daughter Ksusha was born. This is the photo of both of them in those time. So after the doctorate, he entered the in collaboration with experimental group of myself at ITC and the Free University of Berlin, Professor Hans Martin P, where he became a postdoc. And scientific field was hyperpolarization. And in that field, which really eagerly needed a qualified theoretician in those times, he soon developed into one of the leading players in the field by developing a serious important theoretical concept which shaped the field and lead to development of new and more efficient experimental tools. So since then, more than 20 years, we work together and that we are standing together at the entrance of ITC. And here we are at the conference together with Hans Martin Fitt, Nikita and Kostya in Austria, this is the photochemical conference in those days when he was a postdoc in a group of Hans Martin. And this is a rare case when he watched how experiment was working in, on the maintenance of the NMR probe. This is Jan Kostya and this is our uh, electronic engineer, Boris Vasilich Kompankov. So the result of scientific endeavor was not only his second doctorate, this is the Russian equivalent to habilitation known in Germany speaking countries, which his thesis titled Kinetics of Multi-Stage Liquid Phase Process Involving Particles with Spin Degree of Freedom. This is very complex topics. He combined the reaction kinetics with multiple state of, and simultaneously he established a several large scale international collaborations such as uh, European Community Cooperation Science and Technology Action on Hyperpolarization and where he headed the theoretical group. And he took part in the EU project DNP design study and many others. And, He realized the role of scalar interactions and level anti-crossing and cyber and related techniques. So this is the DNP consortium where seven European countries took place and you may recognize familiar faces. And this is Jan Kostya and I'm standing behind of the team. This is the head of the DNP consortium, Thomas Prisna. And this is another leading figure in NMR Professor Griesinger talking to Kostya during our conference in Venice. And this is Kostya preparing to the talk at one of the conferences. So eight years after getting professor degree, he was finally appointed to professor position in physics. And just two years after, he became a director of ITC. This is his group. Theoretical Spin Chemistry Laboratory at ITC at the time when he became director. You see, it's only males. Now it's not that way. They got one girl also. But this is a small group of him working on the Theoretical Chemistry Laboratory. And I want to show you the picture. It's a museum of railway where Kosti usually brought his guests. 
This is a train in the road. And this is a recent picture of him. And he really likes such museum because it symbolized the power of uh, engines and the history of Siberian railway. And there was a bright road in front of him, but that did not realize. The highest moment in his scientific life was the award of Gunther Malkin Prize, which he received at the International Conference of Magnetic Resonance for SABA signal amplification by reversible exchange using parahydrogen uh, as a source of hyperpolarization. He saw spin dynamics of the formation of hyperpolarization. So just to give you a favor, I included three minutes introduction of his talk given during. Do you hear the? Can you hear? No. Sorry, then I will skip it. That's. There was a talk how he introduced his work and the ITC. So as a director, he became very active and many uh, foreigners visited ITC because ITC became important in the hyperpolarization field. So this is again Griesinger and this is Malcolm Levitt giving a lecture in Houses of Scientists, this is Kostya, Renat Sartiev, Nikita, and other members of ITC. So his main topic was level anti-crossing. He found out that the particular peaks of polarization formed at the level anti-crossing. And since we could not see it, and I don't know how, I will skip this part of his introductory lecture as well. So this is his own biography, biography written by him for this particular event. And you can see it's contained only five lines and another final lines, which was stopped in March this year. So he started from engineer, became a PhD student, researcher. For a long time, he was a senior researcher and then leading researcher. And one year and a half, he was a director of ITC. He was not only scientist, he combined it with the teaching activity. And he gave a lecture in Novosibir State University, these are the topics of his lectures. And he was for many years involved in the national as a teaching activity, as invited lecture in the School for Young Researchers and the One Theory. And he was teaching in the group of um, Hans Martin Pitt and the University of Berlin. He was a member of Ampere Society and member of Scientific Committee for Spin Chemistry Meeting or the organizer of conference, Scientific Committee member for the conference Hyperpolarized Magnetic Resonance. In the year 22, it was planned to held in our um, Novosibirsk ATC. In academic ranks, he had a degree of uh, scientist and was professor of Russian Academy of Sciences. And the awards, the highest was the Malkin Prize that he shared together with two other researchers. He had the fellowship of Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and fellowship of Japanese Society for promotion of science in 2016, together with Professor Taku and Professor Sata. And he was awarded by Medal of European Academy of Science in year 10. Kostya, he's here, he's standing in next to the strong uh, tree, and I like his picture very much. He could be a humble and cheerful, easygoing person, but he was a leader with a steel hand, realizing his vision, how things should be done, despite of numerous obstacles. And he never afraid to step up from and standing for his work. He was very lucky guy and he passed his luck over to the people whom he met. Just mentioned that he twice wrote the mega grant proposed and we won it. 
So it's highest uh, grant in, uh, given by president of Russia. And he was the person who wrote proposal twice and two times successfully. So looking backward now, for me, it's quite incredible how much he had accomplished in his very short, but so fruitful life and how much he had started that we have to continue on. And it's our obligation to him, keep things that he initiated going and developing. This will be the best possible homage to Kostya. So we travel a lot, and this is a pictures from different countries, Paris, Venice, Berlin, voting for the new Supreme Soviet, and he is Canada in uh, form, and he was, as a young man, riding the cars, the cars and uh, this is sunny day in one of the park in Berlin. So he liked to play all his life, and he was playing such a funny games, playing along with the guitar. This is a photo from my place in Berlin, and I really enjoy his singing along with the guitar. And he, he's so sort of happy, his 30 years birthday, and this is a present of his friends. So to say simply, the question was a talented scientist, it's really not enough. Because to my mind, he can be most fully characterized by saying he was a passionate scientist. Synonyms of this word are Perry, Perven, or Arden. This is how one can most fully characterize his craving for science. He will to win and to obtain the highest results. Such a craving requires a true scientist who is stronger than the instinct of self self-preservation. In addition, another plus to this was his latent talent, which is the main thing. Kostya was once called an Emma talent by one of the reviewers. And we joke about this uh, definition later, but he indeed was quintessentially mastering the method of magnetic resonance of non-equilibrium system. In science, he gave all his best to the fullest. And I know when something very important and very difficult needed to be done, Kosti will co-op and Kosti will not commit. I was not in the funeral because I was also sick by COVID and we were sick together simultaneously and he was taken to hospital and I stayed home. But late June, we visited with Hans Martin the grave of Kostya, and this is him. And we shall all foster the seeds of love, love to humans and love to science that Kostya planted all over the world. And we hope you and another people who knew Kostya who get to know him now will join us in this. The man has gone, but his spirit will carry on with us. And uh, when COVID pandemic began, Kostya directly issued a decree where the situation with COVID is out of control. When there was listed measures to prevent the spread of COVID within the Institute and the decree ended with the words, take care of yourself. So Kostya took care of everyone, but did not save himself. Thank you all of you for your memories of Kostya and your support. Peace and love. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we, I saw the, uh, yeah, actually uh, memory came, came back to me as, as well. Anyway, uh, Alexander, I, do you accept a question? Yeah, please. Okay. I sacrificed uh, the scientific okay. lecture, which is okay. in the, but, uh, this but is very this, is more, this is more important, yeah. I think, at this moment. Yeah, yeah. so any question? 
comment? A bit difficult to see. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. It, Thank it you very much. Hard, okay. but yeah. We will remember him, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. After his death, there was so many papers he submitted yeah. and he was highly productive. And so we finished yeah. all of them and they are all has dedication to him. So I have to say that at least 12 we finished already during the reviewing process. And uh, two of them were in Angivante Hibi. One was reviewing the progress of magnetic resonance. So he was incredibly productive and really rising star. It, it's, do you know who said, uh, do you know who said uh, NMR talent? I know, but I won't say. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because it's a reviewer, it's a <laughs> anonymous, but mm -hmm. I know. Uh -huh. You can guess. But, anyway. but that, that's true. I, and he's really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. to get such a review was remarkable. And mm -hmm. he was somewhat uh, confused by that and the joke about him. Oh, mm -hmm. this is our Enamata line. But that's true. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, thank you again. And we will now move to the next speaker. And the speaker is uh, probably EPR talent, <laughs> must be fading. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. I don't know. Somehow yes. it seems that uh, the slide is truncated. I don't know what is the problem, but uh, yeah. Anyway, we can live with that. So I I I should say I fully join uh, Alexandra with all these kind words to Kostya and kind memories. I I, I think probably. In, in this audience, I had the pleasure to uh, know him from the very earliest time because we first met when uh, we were very young. We studied together in university, so I had the pleasure of knowing Kostya since 1994. And uh, these are some very old photos, and uh, in the bottom, uh, this is one of the first EPR schools in uh, Belgium, uh, something like 20 or about years ago, and other photos also from Venus. So we, we attended together many conferences. So we will, yeah, I don't know. My, my, my thoughts of Kostya always go to that, to those earlier times. And uh, uh, these are very nice memories. Yeah. And uh, today for, for the scientific part, I, uh, I selected the talk on one of the fields where Kostya was uh, also active in the last uh, several years. Uh, this is on also in the in, in the mainstream of this conference. Um, it's on quantum computing, or let's say qubits, and uh, qubits challenge from materials science uh, side. So this was this is on spin manipulation at ambient conditions in bladder radical grafted mesoporous silica. The work was done in collaboration with uh, Hamburg University team and uh, International Tomography Center. Uh, yeah, perhaps all of you know what is a qubit and there is no need to say why quantum computing is uh, beneficial, why it has to be studied and pursued. And uh, probably the very first challenge of for uh, potential qubits uh, is long decoherence time because this is what limits the, the, the length of the calculation uh, sequence and uh, the longer the decoherence time is the better. So uh, recently many works were done uh, using the vanadyl qubits. Um, this, uh, well, they attracted much attention 
from different scientists because at room temperature, uh, the electron decoherence time, TM, is uh, relatively long. It's uh, about one microsecond. And also because this is a coordination compound, it can be constructed into something more complicated and even uh, moves can be uh, done with, um, with the aim of doing qubits. And I, I think Professor Yamashita mentioned this work, this compound. So uh, the excellent work of uh, Roberta Sessa, Lidana Friedman, uh, Josef Zandorzny, Professor Yamashita, and some other colleagues is uh, gratefully uh, acknowledged in this field. I'm sorry, some of the um, of the references are perhaps off the screen, but uh, nevertheless. And uh, always when I uh, listen to these lectures on uh, um, brilliant vanadyl results, I had another question. Why not using radicals for the room temperature qubits? Well, um, they are not, well, uh, normal nitroxide radicals, of course, are fast relaxing at room temperature and perhaps 600 or 700 nanoseconds is the phase memory time that you can achieve. But uh, other types of radicals like tritial radicals uh, have sufficiently longer uh, relaxation time, you know, longer than vanadyl units. And uh, some people can say that uh, these radicals are not uh, stable enough, not as stable as vanadyl qubits. No, uh, some radicals are very stable. Like these triazinyl radicals, they are stable at room temperature and even in some aggressive uh, environments, they're extremely stable. Also some uh, structures like MOVs can be done with these triazinyl radicals as we showed in one of our recent works. And uh, one of conclusions from vanadyl work was that you need a nuclear spin-free environment to prolong uh, the phase memory time as long as you can. And uh, this can also be achieved by embedding radicals in, uh, let's say, such scaffolds as uh, organosilica. And uh, therefore, this was a strategy in this work. So uh, triazinyl radicals were uh, embedded in this organosilica compound, it contains long, uh, let's say, channels, 9.1 nanometers in diameter. This compound is called SBA15. And uh, it was functionalized with these triazinyl radicals, butter type radicals. Uh, and we used several different loadings of radicals, uh, more or less of them, to control spin concentration. And first of all, we studied these radicals in solution. And uh, these are the typical spectra. Uh, the hyperfan structure originates from these three nitrogen nuclei, and uh, such spectra are very well known. However, surprisingly, we did not find any data on uh, anisotropic couplings, uh, hyperfan interactions, and G tensor in these type of radicals. So we had to do this work. And sorry, perhaps you do not see the values, but nevertheless, they were obtained. Uh, from combined X and Q band uh, studies of frozen solutions. And exactly the same spectra update in, are obtained in solid state at room temperature by pulse EPR um, uh, for different radical loadings in these systems. So uh, then, of course, we uh, went to the point. We studied the uh, phase memory time and also uh, T1 time for these radicals embedded in organosilica versus temperature. And what we observe that at room temperature, yeah, of course we obtain, uh, we observe the dependence on uh, percentage of radicals embedded and uh, uh, the, the longest uh, decoherence time reaches uh, 2.3 microseconds at 300K for, for the least concentrated sample. And just to compare with uh, vanadyl qubits, uh, the, the, the highest, the record value was 1.04 microseconds at also at room temperature. So uh, this is not an order of magnitude enhancement, but quite noticeable enhancement uh, in case of blotter radicals in organosilica. And uh, yeah, they are advantages really at high temperatures. And even we see that uh, if we use smaller radical concentrations, we can still prolong uh, the electron decoherence time. 
Uh, but uh, of course, here you have to find a compromise uh, for the signal intensity and the relaxation time. Uh, we also studied the field dependence of uh, electron decoherence time for these qubits. And uh, what we see is that, in fact, the, the, the longest decoherence is observed at the maximum of the spectrum. And uh, this is good because if you compare with one ideal qubits, then you have the, here the complicated and broad spectrum. And in fact, the single uh, maximum intensity is observed in uh, the position uh, one, but the longest decoherence time that I've showed before is observed at the edge of the spectrum where the intensity is quite uh, small. So uh, there is always a, a problem of trade-off mm, in uh, one agile qubits. There is no such problem in uh, bladder radical qubits. So everything is good here. And we have also studied in detail the, the uh, dependence of spectral shapes and relaxation times uh, on uh, radical concentration. And yeah, uh, I mean, the relaxation time is already profoundly long. So the, the, the such subtle effects as instantaneous diffusion play a role. And for the most concentrated samples, we observe spectral distortions. And we can uh, trace these distortions as a function of uh, pulse length, or let's say excitation bandwidth uh, dependence, uh, selectivity of these pulses. And uh, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> um, we can confuse sometimes such spectral shapes with uh, triplet spectral shapes because they look exactly the same. But these are really the artifacts of using the hard pulses. And uh, if we use longer pulses, we obtain the, uh, the correct line shapes. This is just a warning because uh, really this looks like a triplet spectrum and it can be simulated with reasonable parameters, but it is not. This is just an artifact. And for least concentrated samples, we have almost no uh, distortions at any pulse length. Finally, uh, we performed the, let's say, proof of the principle experiment in this field. It already became like that. Um, these are notation, transient notations. Uh, only modification is that we used FID detection here, but uh, also we could use simple echo. The result is uh, the same. And um, you see that we have many oscillations at different microwave power, and always the frequency corresponds uh, to the Rabin notation frequency and the dependence is linear. So uh, with this experiment, we really prove that uh, yeah, quantum operations are possible at room temperature for these systems. So uh, to conclude and make some outlooks, uh, we have observed that such qubits uh, um, uh, using uh, triazinyl or bladder type radicals at room temperature are possible. And uh, in organosilica host, we have a nuclear spin free environment. This allows us to obtain quite long electron decoherence time, longer than, uh, than for vanadyl qubits. Also, these radicals are extremely stable. Uh, and they are stable just on their own, but if we in, embed them into the channels, and if we, for example, uh, you know, close these channels with something else, we can even make them more stable. So this porous host has uh, additional advantages um, uh, for stability. And also, this is to be investigated in more detail, but we have performed some test experiments. We can impact the relaxation and some other properties by adding other molecules into uh, these channels. So this is additional functionality can, which can be also uh, exported. And uh, we also envision that uh, some ordered arrays. At, at the moment, the, the radicals are disordered inside these channels, but the ordering is possible. There are some works in this direction done with uh, so-called biphenyl bridged uh, organosilica. Uh, we had also some questions from reviewers of this paper on possibilities for scalability and entanglement. And uh, what we think is uh, uh, that, yeah, we can do that by this um, Mm, uh, creating 
of arrays of radicals, um, ordered arrays. Also for initialization and individual addressing, uh, what we plan now is to embed additional um, um, photo, excited, photo excitable molecules like porphyrins uh, and uh, use them to transfer uh, hyperpolarization onto the radicals. This work is already in progress and this can both serve for initialization because usually initialization is good at low temperature, but we want to do quantum computer at room temperature. So we have to create a huge polarization uh, to initialize your states. And also for individual addressing using optical light. Finally, I would like to uh, thank all uh, people involved in this project. This is our uh, MOFIA team, Artyom and Daniel from our lab uh, and uh, excellent Hamburg team, Efraj Gusi and Frank Hoffman and Professor Mikhail Fauba. Uh, this work was supported by a joint uh, grant of uh, Russian Foundation for Basic, Basic Research and DFG. And uh, the paper is also already published. Uh, you can go in more detail here. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh Okay, thank you very much. A very nice talk. Uh, now uh, open to the discussion. Any question? Okay, uh, just a moment. But if not, okay, I have a, one, a few questions. Actually, one question is a quite general question about uh, 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 phase memory time in the for the quantum computing. Uh, if uh, if we think about uh, long t kind of TM or T2 memory, uh, T2 time. In this case, one thing is just to uh, re reduce the mobility, yeah? But uh, in contrast, we can also think about uh, uh, motion narrowing limit, also the long T, uh, TM value. Uh, could you comment about this kind of balance of the motion narrowing versus uh, freezing condition? Well, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, I mean, in the end, we would like to do, to excite selectively uh, several transitions to make yeah. entangled state. And uh, if your uh, radical, for example, or some other qubit is rapidly rotating, then all these yeah. anisotropic interactions will be averaged. So it would be difficult to address uh, different transitions, different states. This is what first uh -huh. comes to my mind. But also, um, I mean, for example, for trivial radicals, we do not have, we have some increase in case of uh, rotating radical, but uh -huh. um, it's not uh, decisively, let's say, it's not, it's not so dramatic to really uh -huh. overcome other drawbacks of this approach. So I, I, I would say, in, in NMR, people pursue, uh, pursue this strategy, but uh, yeah. in, in EPR, we better use in solid state. That, that's my okay. thinking. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other question? Um, I think Alex has. Yeah, but there was, an other, there was another question, which was uh, by Kira Vostrikova before in the chat. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think this question was not about size, but just about uh, presentation that we cannot see in the lower part. Of ah, the okay. Screen. I couldn't. I, I think only your question is. I size. I couldn't I couldn't read it. Therefore, uh, I just saw the question. Um, Matvey, congrats to this super cool work. Um, yeah. I have a question which is in line what uh, Kiminori already asked. Do you understand actually the relaxation mechanism which leads to this anisotropic uh, TM uh, versus field? Because it's it's cool, but it's somehow um, surprising that you have the lowest or nearly the lowest relaxation time in the center of the uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it's it's um, let's say uh, 
my, my thinking is that the relaxation is caused by uh, vibration of, uh, let's say, of, of uh, hyperfine tensors of nuclei, uh, of nitrogen nuclei. In, in our case, uh, these radicals are attached to the walls from, in, from inside, to the walls of these uh, channels. So they, in principle, are not really in the rigid scaffold. Yeah. So they can a little bit move due to just some thermal perturbation. So I would think that uh, the main relaxation mechanism stems from, from this source. And uh, in this case, it's indeed the central part is most isotropic. And therefore the, the, the relaxation is uh, the slowest in the central part. It's uh, more or less the same for nitroxide radical, for normal like tempo radical. You, uh, in case of like librations, yeah, you have the longest relaxation at the center of the spectrum and you have a little bit shorter relaxation if a radical liberates on the on, on the sides really yeah yeah that's that that was uh, remember the opposite actually but i'm <laughs> no 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 this is this is uh, really true because because, because we, you we have, use and you have um in at the edges you have on you select only one orientation but in the center you have contributions from different orientations therefore you have a superposition of different uh, exponentials there uh, you mean, uh, well, you don't select the unique uh, orientation in the center, but the superposition of, you know, this uh, you, colored you, you, balls. If you if you visualize this on a on a sphere, yeah, you, you are right. I, I was speaking not of the very edges, but uh, of the let's say plateaus on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. That that's where we usually measure. But anyway, this has to be studied in more detail. I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, is there can can this be simulated with the under the assumption which you measure um, which which you just mentioned? Uh, sorry, what exactly? Can you can you it? can you simulate the anisotropy of the um, phase memory time? Uh, I function? didn't I didn't try yet. <laughs> we have to think of it. Mm -hmm. I just thought it, is, it may be important because if you know uh, where this anisotropy or where the what the dominating uh, relaxation mechanism is, one may think about strategies to um, to increase it. Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a good idea. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again to uh, Matvey. Okay. Thank you very much. And now move to the sec uh, last speaker of the ah uh, uh, not the last speaker. Sorry. Before. Last speaker before the break, uh, speaker is Daniel Abergel, okay, from Sorbonne, uh, France. Okay, please. Thank you. I'm on my screen. Uh, Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me uh, to this very interesting, uh, interesting conference, and uh, I, I've listened to um, many of the. Uh, of the comments of the uh, of the contributors, uh, comments about Kostya. Uh, uh, someone they know, they knew much better than I did. But I, I just want to say a few words because, as, as all of you, I was very moved by by uh, his passing, and uh, I only met him a few years ago when he visited the, at the Ecole Normale in Paris. And uh, and uh, he, I, I remember he was very energetic. He was very, you know, it was scientifically. I don't have to say again what has been said, but um, it was a, a real pleasure to listen and discuss with him. He, I remember that he brought a number of ideas in the lab, and we started collaborating 
we started to collaborate with them, uh, Jeffrey Bunhausen, Fabian Ferraz and myself, on different topics actually, which is uh, in itself uh, uh, you know, a sign of, uh, of its uh, great uh, agility, I'd say. <laughs> And uh, he was some, someone very, uh, he had a very deep mind scientifically, but also he was a very uh, congenial, very, I, from what I, I can say, a uh, very uh, profound human being. So uh, when, the, uh, the first, when the COVID pandemic started, uh, he, he right away suggested that we could make these uh, online seminars to to overcome the uh, the lack of uh, gathering that was uh, foreseen. And uh, together with uh, Gerd Bentowski in Darmstadt and, and uh, Madhu in Hyderabad, uh, we set up these weekly seminars and we were very happy to do this. Uh, it, was a, it was a way for us also to meet uh, a little bit more than once a week and for, for almost one year, uh, we, we became much closer and even if we uh, didn't have a chance to meet physically, uh, we were always in contact and we, I, I did say that we became friends. So all of us were moved by, by again, by his passing and we just, okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I appreciate it very much that uh, this, uh, this session of well, this day has been uh, dedicated to his memory. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of science too. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, something that is that may uh, appear pretty simple uh, because it's not quantum, it's, it's classical. I mean, it's treated by classical ways, but uh, it's about non-linearity that appear in the DMP hyperpolarized spins at low temperatures. So, um, as you all know, the uh, one of the main issues in uh, NMR sensitivity and the flow in the, since the late fifties, uh, people have uh, investigated this uh, uh, DMP process, and uh, so the idea is that sensitivity in NMR is proportional to the uh, length. The magnitude of magnetization, and um, if you consider a population of uh, spins one half in the magnetic field, well, the population uh, is uh, given by Boltzmann law, which which make which, which states that the lower energy are more populated than the higher energy states, and therefore uh, you you get a uh, relative difference population given by this uh, known law, the, the polarization. Uh, given by uh, this uh, hyperbolic tangent law. And <clears throat> if you want to increase the magnetization, you want to increase also polarization. One way is to increase the polarization. And so if you look at the, uh, this expression, you have two ways to do this, uh, either increase the field or decrease the temperature. So if you increase the field uh, or decrease the temperature, the effects are the following. Suppose uh, here, here are three examples uh, for B0 field of 6.7 Tesla to 14 Tesla. At any temperature, the polarization is ridiculously small. And, and uh, so it's not very effective. Uh, and even at low temperature, increasing the field, uh, doesn't doesn't allow you to to get much higher concentration uh, polarization. You increase by a factor of hundred, but that's that may not be enough for uh, uh, for some applications. So if you look at the graph here on the right, you you, you see the polarizations of uh, different nuclei: protons, carbons, uh, carbon thirteen, red, protons in 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 black. But you see the a scheme uh, a diagram that all of you know uh, is that if you look at the polarization of the electrons uh, below one Kelvin, they're almost totally polarized. So the idea of uh, uh, DNP is to transfer this polarization to the nuclei, to nearby nuclei using uh, 
coupling uh, mechanisms. So uh, I won't say a lot about uh, DNP because it's not the, the purpose of my, of my talk, but uh, basically it created an out of equilibrium, large nuclear spin polarization, therefore large magnetization that allows to increase the minimal signal. And the, the way we do this is to irradiate the zeno transition of the electrons, electron spins, uh, to polarize these nuclear spins because they're coupled through uh, hyperfine uh, couplings, interactions. And so uh, the mechanisms are, are very diverse and, and uh, uh, several approaches can, can uh, be used to describe them. So if you have, uh, in some cases you can describe the uh, DMP process, the hypervalorization process, process uh, using a simple, uh, simple quantum system, like the solid effect that involves only one electron and one nucleus, or the so-called cross effect that takes place in many cases, but is, uh, is highly used in, in the solid state uh, NAS DNP today. And uh, that involves two, uh, electron spins and one nuclear spin. But uh, in some cases, uh, it is possible to use not a quantum dynamical description of the system, but thermodynamical concepts. And this was introduced uh, in the 60s or so as the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the so the thermodynamical description involves the uh, spin temperature concept. And therefore, in this view, uh, the uh, DNP process was described as a thermal mixing, in which uh, only spin temperatures, that is, uh, the, the process of uh, DNP is described in terms of uh, rate equations that involve spin temperatures between different spin reservoirs. Now, uh, what we were interested in initially, and what we are still interested in, is uh, dissolution DNP. So this was uh, one of the uh, breakthrough of DNP in the, in the early, to, uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, millennium, let's say. Um, so the idea was to polarize spins and uh, flush hot water, pressurized water, onto the hyperpolarized sample at cryogenic temperature, at the temperature in the helium bath, and to uh, project this uh, hyperpolarized sample to a conventional in mass spectrometer and perform uh, experiments at ambient temperature using a huge polarization with a gain of several orders of magnitude up to uh, 10,000. Uh, so this was a real breakthrough that was uh, uh, invented by uh, Jan Hendrik Harding Larsen, and uh, so the instrument that we have here is uh, is a this is a sketch of the inside of a polarizer where you have the helium bath, an NMR system, NMR coils, and the, the, just a simple holder and a waveguide that, that shines microwave in a crude way onto the sample. So this is the uh, very basic uh, apparatus that we use. And this is the, uh, the picture of the, um, uh, of the instrumentation uh, with the polarizer here, the uh, 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 microwave source view from the top. And this dissolution box that will uh, in be introduced here to uh, flush the uh, system and send it to the NMR spectrometer. So, we started to do these experiments, but um, we uh, observed actually uh, unusual. Uh, I mean, we had were surprised by the observation of the NMR signal during the DNP process. So uh, the experiments that I'm going to describe in the system is very simple. It's, it's really this, this standard, I'd say, uh, dissolution DMP uh, mixture 
uh, using the glycine, uh, glycine agent cholesterol plus a mixture of D2 and H2O and uh, 50 millimole of temple as the polarizing agent. And uh, this so uh, hyperpolarization took place at 6.7 Tesla and 1.2 K ground uh, through microwave irradiation that corresponds to this field that is uh, 188.33 gigahertz. So uh, in the solid, the uh, uh, so we have a, a, an amorphous solid and we expect to see a broad line. And this is what we see uh, when the sample at the bottom of the, the spectrum of the sketch, uh, when, the, uh, when the sample is not highly polarized, you see a broad lines with a, about 25 kilohertz width, which is uh, expected. But what we saw, uh, so, so it means that the FID actually decays in a few hundreds of microseconds. So we used to uh, observe uh, FIDs uh, with a one millisecond time window. But when we observed in this case was that uh, with increasing polarization, the, uh, the line width was uh, actually reduced to reach a very narrow line of two kilohertz at high polarization. So this was uh, pretty surprising. Um, but actually, if, if you extend the duration of the observation, what you see is that the FID does not uh, decay after one millisecond, but instead it, it, it happens to be much longer. And uh, <clears throat> so this happened in some circumstances. One of it, uh, one condition is that the polarization uh, was negative. Uh, of course, I'll return to that later. And so, uh, so the, the main observation is the following. Uh, we had very long FIDs with uh, uh, bursts of uh, signals, of signal, and, and with a very long time decay that extends over a second. And if we zoom uh, uh, on the, the, the early region, early time region of the FID, what we see is a succession of, um, uh, of what seem to be maser bursts with a, a close-up here. So this was a somewhat intriguing, and we started to, to uh, uh, have a closer look at these. Now, this sorry, so this was obtained uh, after polarization, uh, hyperpolarization of the nuclear spins, the proton spins, because the, these are the spins that we study, uh, that we observe, and uh, microwave remain on during the acquisition. So we keep uh, polarizing the spins through DNP. But what also uh, was observed that if we just prepared the spins in this highly polarized state and we turn off the microwave during acquisition, we could still see this kind of, of behavior. And this is, uh, so it is pretty easy to understand that we get maser, as I will say in a minute. I mean, this is this is understandable. What is, done, what is more difficult to understand is that when you turn off the microwave irradiation, you, you may still have this phenomenon. And so uh, this is an example that we that we saw that we one of the examples, one of the many FIDs that we observed. And here I just want to show that we had seen for uh, thirty seconds over 30 seconds. So now what happens? So, so we did something very uh, basic. We detuned the probe. By detuning the probe, uh, the coupling of the spins with the, with the coil is not efficient. And um, we expect, uh, so what we observed was this. That is a very short FID and a very broad line. That is the uh, usual FID of a of a of a of an amorphous solid uh, protons in, in 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 a solid. And so this is a very uh, 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 important sign that radiation radiation damping is involved in this process. 
radiation damping that uh, determines the coupling between the spins and the coil. So uh, this, uh, these measures, of course, has been observed by many people in, in many uh, circumstances, and we have worked on these, uh, say, a long time ago in this in solution state. So in, in a totally different context, where the lines are very much narrower, a few hertz only, and uh, uh, and so this kind of uh, you know, this kind of FID is is known, but. Still, it requires some uh, some further investigation. So, what is radiation damping? Uh, all of these phenomena can be described classically. You, know, uh, you can uh, you can uh, make things more difficult, <laughs> but uh, the idea is the following: uh, you, you have a processing and magnetization about a beam field. This is a sketch in the uh, rotating frame, say, and this is the core. So the precession of the transverse magnetization induces a near-MF uh, electromotive force uh, uh, voltage at the ends at the ends of the uh, detecting coil, which is the uh, actually which makes the uh, detection of signal possible. Uh, but in terms, this voltage is associated with a current that circulates in the coil which creates a field, uh, a, a radio frequency modulated field that adds back on magnetization. So this is a feedback system. <clears throat> and the action of this field is actually to uh, rotate back the magnetization to its equilibrium position. So this was described in the, in the mid 50s uh, by Bloomberg and Powell. And there's a very nice paper by Genia and collaborator in, in uh, uh, Rosenberg in 1995 that, that describes the, uh, this, uh, this process in a dynamical, in a, in a more dynamical way that is, um, uh, that I would recommend. <laughs> so this process is, is always present, of course, but it's, it's only important if the magnetization is large, if the transverse magnetization is large, okay? If you just have uh, thermally polarized uh, spins, then you will need a huge amount of spins to get some signal, some, 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 uh, uh, some uh, significant radius and damping field. So this is, uh, this is a known problem for people in uh, high, uh, high resolution in the world. The world in, uh, in AQ solutions, because this is basically a solving problem. So the, uh, the effect of uh, radiation damping can be, uh, uh, can be formalized in this, in this transformed uh, block equation, the processing equation where there's no relaxation for the, time, for the moment. And what you see here, is that uh, it gives rise to a nonlinear contribution because you have a field that depends on the magnetization, on the transverse magnetization components. And so um, this uh, uh, type of equation is, is much, is, uh, yeah, is a nonlinear equation and it, it, it leads to unusual, uh, uh, I mean, behaviors of the magnetization that and if I do that, we will not decay exponentially to zero when you have relaxation. So there's a coupling factor. This G, gamma G factor is a coupling factor with the coil that depends on the uh, filling factor and the Q of the probe, quality factor of the probe. And it's characterized by time constant that, uh, that has this expression. So, uh, in this, in the case where you don't have, where there's no relaxation, uh, you can you can find explicit solutions of uh, the transverse and longitudinal uh, magnetizations. Uh, so the transverse has this hyperbolic second profile, while the longitudinal has this 
uh, hyperbolic tangent profile. And rather than you know, uh, dwell too long with these equations, I will just give you a few examples of these solutions. So suppose you do a, uh, you prepare the system with a 60 degree pulse. You see the FID is almost exponential. And the Z component goes back from, uh, seems to, uh, you know, to go back exponentially to its equilibrium solution. If you look at the trajectory on the sphere block, it just, you just the tip of the magnetization just describes a, 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 a trajectory on the block sphere because uh, the, uh, these equations, radiation damping conserves the magnitude of the magnetization. This is why uh, um, I have to say it's, it is not a relaxation process. Uh, we can discuss this afterwards. Now, if you do a 180, 180, uh, 120 degree pulse, then the, the shape of the FID is different because it, it rises a bit and then decays. Okay, and this is this uh, uh, is a uh, an expression of this trajectory. This corresponds to this trajectory. So you see that the typical magnetization uh, still uh, evolves on the block sphere and returns to its equilibrium position where the transverse field is zero because the, the radiation damping field is proportional to this transverse magnetization. So eventually it becomes zero, so there's no more effect. And when you initially tip, flip the magnetization by almost 180 degrees, then you see that the, the, uh, the evolution of the FID is a, a growth and a decay that uh, corresponds to the fact that the, the magnetization does not relax close to the z-axis, but instead um, processes about a magnetization-dependent field that flips it back to its uh, equilibrium position. So it's an unusual um, behavior. Now, what happens when you have T1 and T2 relaxation? So the profile is somehow degraded. You see here the radiation damping effect, which is attenuated by T2, so that the maximum does not correspond to the uh, uh, the maximum of the signal does not correspond to the uh, uh, maximum of the uh, sorry the the maximum signal does not correspond to the maximum uh, magnitude of the magnetization because it has relaxed in the process. But if T two is longer than the characteristic radius and damping time, you still have this uh, uh, radius and damping effect. And then T1, which is uh, usually much longer than uh, T2, takes over. And you see that the last part is T1 relaxation, basically. OK? So this is when you have T1 and T2 relaxation, uh, there's a uh, big difference. Uh, the norm, the magnitude of the magnetization is not conserved. And so the motion takes place within the block sphere, not on the surface of the sphere. Now, what happens if you start from a negative polarization? So this is this was the previous uh, <coughs> uh, sketch. But if you assume that T1, you have some process that does not lead uh, the magnetization towards it's equilibrium, but towards a negative polarization. <clears throat> so it means that eventually uh, the, uh, you expect your magnetization to be negative. And so this is what the simulation shows. You have this kind of process and, and eventually it reaches a state where uh, the uh, magnetization is not the equilibrium one, but some magnetization uh, some negative magnetization. And if you look at the corresponding FID, so the envelope of the FID or the envelope of the transverse magnetization, you have these succession of maser pulses. 
Okay, <clears throat> and so if you have, if you observe this, it means that somehow your monetization has to go back to negative. Now, if you look at this simple model, what you see in the previous model, you see that at long times, uh, <clears throat> after these births, the, the, this simple model predicts just a constant and uh, non-decaying stationary state. Okay, so basically our conclusions were that in order to observe what we observed, we would need three different ingredients. First, a large negative magnetization to trigger radiation damping, because initially the magnetization should be uh, close to the minus Z axis, otherwise it is always close to the plus Z and always remains there. So it has to be negatively polarized and hyperpolarized because you need a large monetization. And also, there has to be some additional damping mechanism to account for the long decay of the FID. The long decay after when the births have disappeared, the long decay that, that we observed up to tens of seconds. So the assumption was that the uh, uh, proton magnetization the proton spin should be repolarized somehow. And so the assumption is that th this repolarization must come from a different nucleus reservoir. And so uh, this is the crosstalk with other nuclear reservoirs. In, in a case, will be the deuterons that are present in the sample and that are polarized simultaneously together with the protons when the microwave is shining on the uh, Zeeman electron transition. So I will just present uh, in a few words the uh, thermal mixing setup of this experiment. So this is the, uh, uh, the RSS circuit uh, that, that uh, represents the coil, the detection system. This is the uh, ensemble of uh, Zeeman spins that exchange energy, that give energy to the core through their coupling. And these boxes represent the, the, the four uh, Zeeman uh, and non-Zeeman reservoirs uh, involved in, in thermal mixing. So in a few words, uh, microwave irradiation couples the uh, Zeeman uh, to the non-Zeeman dipole-dipole reservoir of the electrons. And these electrons are coupled through dipolar interaction with the nuclei, with both nuclei. And um, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the exchange of energy uh, or the exchange of spin temperature can be described with rate equations that were divided by the uh, celebrated uh, provider of equations. So, Basically, what happens is that we have this reservoir that are coupled, and this, the uh, proton spins are the only ones that are coupled to the probe because they're the only ones that are on resonance with the probe. There's no radiation damping from the deuterons with the uh, core at the uh, proton frequency. So, this is the setup. This is the usual uh, thermal mixing setup. And this is the usual uh, radiation damping setup. So uh, this was investigated uh, some decades ago by Bozega and Al and collaborators. So, and uh, <clears throat> so it's possible to merge the radiation damping equations with the rate equations of the inverse spin temperatures of these reservoirs that were derived by Provotrov. So the, the idea is that in red, you have the radiation damping terms of the magnetization uh, dynamics. In blue here, you have a coupling. These terms, so this uh, fraction here, multiplied by this endless spin temperature, uh, proton spin temperature, is just the Z component of the proton magnetization. 
Okay. And this is coupled to the dipole-dipole uh, uh, electron uh, reservoir. So it means that the, uh, <clears throat> the Z component decays or relaxes to the spin temperature of the electron dipole dipole reservoir and the other spin temperatures are given by broad rough equations with rates that uh, are related to one another through the um, heat capacities of the various reservoirs. So we use these uh, equations. It, it's very, actually, it is pretty difficult to, uh, it is not possible to give analytical solution of these equations. And because it's not linear, it is also very difficult. I mean, it's not obvious that we can get qualitative uh, analysis. So we did this, we did a qualitative analysis of these, uh, this set of equation by finding the fixed point that is the, uh, the uh, stationary solutions. And we could, it's possible to, to show that <clears throat> this system for some, in some cases can have a, um, a stationary solution that is different from the thermal equilibrium. And, uh, and so uh, I won't go into the details of this qualitative this was uh, study, this was published. Uh, I'll, I'll just show some simulations. So what we did, we first simplified the, uh, the system. So if you look at here, this inverse spin temperature will have a multi-exponential solution. What we just assumed is that the uh, uh, proton polarization, magnetization, will access to some time varying uh, uh, value that eventually reaches th uh, the thermal distribution of the lattice. So we have the simplified uh, radius and damping equation with a uh, a stationary, uh, like a so, sort of thermal solution that depends with time and that decays to its lattice. It starts from the high, highly polarized state to the lattice state. And using this model, we could fit uh, the, uh, uh, the FIDs that we observed. So this solution is valid. We use this solution in cases of of uh, <clears throat> where, where the microwave was turned off during acquisition, and so we see that we can we can get uh, more or less uh, satisfactory fitting of the experiments. Now, uh, <clears throat> this means that basically uh, this system measure. In the absence of microwave irradiation during acquisition, shows that there is a, a thermal contact between the deuterons and the protons through the electron dipole dipole reservoir, which represents the efficient coupling between both nuclei and reservoirs. Now, if we look at the details of the of the FIDs, we see that there are some features that cannot be explained. By the uh, by, the simple model, and so uh, we try to investigate uh, this. And what you see is that the bursts are actually often asymmetric, and the first burst, which is the most intense, has always often this echo-like structure. So uh, this questions this uh, the simple system model that we use and. Uh, first, uh, it may be that the block equations uh, may not be valid and solid, and um, be, that is a, a you know a, a network of uh, double coupled spins. So uh, we try to take into account the um, the explicitly the coupling between the uh, nuclear spins in the system to see uh, whether it would be uh, 
uh, a useful approach to describe the FIDs that we observed. So we did a very simple thing. Uh, we we model a, a, a classical spin on the lattice, and we use this uh, approach, this algorithm that was uh, um, introduced some time ago by Anson collaborators uh, <clears throat> to calculate the field at each time. So at each time we have the radiation damping field and the uh, and the, the uh, dipole field. Which is uh, computed through a uh, its Fourier transform in Fourier space uh, for to speed up the uh, the computation because the the dipole um, double field is a expressed as a convolution between this term and the magnetization term. So uh, <clears throat> going over to the uh, uh, Fourier space make things faster by using a multiplication of and, and the FFT algorithm that is um, that, that is fast, and so this is how the field is calculated at each, at each step of the process, and then the derivative is taken, and, and the magnetization is advanced. So we did that, and uh, what you see here is the uh, for one simulation. So we we uh, we assume an initial Boltzmann hyperpolarized in Boltzmann distribution. So it's in a very low uh, spin temperature. And this is the signal in green, the signal envelope that we get. You see that, uh, of course, we, can, we recover these major pulses, which is expected because we have introduced radiation damping. But uh, you see that it, it is very noisy and it, it is very time consuming to just to get 15 milliseconds of simulation. So. This is just a preliminary, preliminary um, uh, investigation, and we're going to uh, <clears throat> to increase the number of spins and uh, change the uh, shape of the sample, etc. But this is uh, probably uh, this will be probably limited by the length of the simulations that we want to make if we want to observe both the major part and the long time part. And so we, uh, we thought that there may be an easier way uh, by taking into account the uh, uh, dipolar effect, I mean, the effect of the dipolar field through a, uh, an empirical um, relaxation rate, which is going to depend on the polarization. And so uh, <clears throat> what we did is use this uh, polarization dependent transverse relaxation rates together with a B naught in homogeneity, where the sample is actually constituted of uh, isochromates with di distributed resonance frequencies. And in practice, in a, on a, in a polarizer, uh, the line width is about uh, between one and three kilohertz width wide. So if we combine both these effects, and we return to the simple block or Maxwell block virtual equation for each isochromat. So we get it. So this is an experiment. And this is, I don't know if you see it because I have uh, something superimposed on my screen. Uh, but what you see is that we can uh, mimic these. This is not a fit of these experiments, but you can mimic the uh, echo-like structure of the first and the asymmetry uh, of the further bursts. So this may be a uh, better uh, uh, approach to, to simulate and to fit the experiments. Now, uh, this is about <clears throat> all of the uh, preliminary work. I just want to add a uh, something that what we want to do now is to actually control the onset of these major pulses so that we can make the uh, spin system in a major, in a sustained major uh, condition so that we can observe this long term evolution because these long term evolutions contain the parameters of the thermal mixing. <clears throat> and 
these uh, spontaneous, I mean, uh, spontaneous obs uh, observation of these spontaneous uh, system measure uh, processes uh, are totally uncontrollable. So uh, this is what we were doing. So we uh, uh, designed a uh, feedback, electronic feedback device that allows to uh, control the radiation damping field. In this case, you see in a solution state, conventional NMR spectrometer, you see the uh, typical laser effect. This is on, on, uh, on uh, just pure water at room temperature. And uh, if you detect the signal, pick up a small amount of the signal, analyzes, analyze it in terms of phase and frequency, and control the phase and frequency and return and, and uh, uh, feed it back to the probe, then you can uh, <clears throat> feed back a compensation field, com compensating field and that allows to uh, to eliminate this radiation damping. So this is when the feedback is active. So you see that the, after close to 180 poles, the FID is very small in the case exponentially there are a few artifacts, but basically that's the idea. <clears throat> so if we can, uh, we're now in the process of implementing this system on a polarizer to uh, be involved to produce at will these um, uh, laser bursts. So this is basically what I wanted to uh, tell you today. Now I have to uh, thank my uh, current and, and, and uh, Former students, uh, Vinit Tartako. Sorry, I misspelled it. Uh, and in the I'm working on it. And my colleagues, who uh, are uh, engineers that work on the uh, instrumentation. And uh, Jeffrey Bodenhausen, also for having brought this polarizer in the lab <laughs> in the first place. And I know with my colleague. Uh, uh, we built this feedback system at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, time is, I'm sorry, time is very uh, out. So let uh, uh, this time, please, uh, if you have uh, some question, please send by chat. Is it all right? Okay. And also the, uh, we have a uh, just a five minute break, okay? So the, after five minutes, we uh, we restart the session. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again, uh, uh, thank Daniel, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, now break.